Hey, Margie here. I'm really excited about today's episode, and it's one you do not want to miss because we're talking about the parathyroid glands, and they have a big impact when it comes to our bones and overall health. But unfortunately, oftentimes the diagnosis is missed until many years go by, and people have lost so much bone unnecessarily. So the good news is there's a lot that can be done, and this is treatable but it needs to be picked up. So we're going to delve into this very important topic with someone who deals with this every single day and is a parathyroid surgeon, Dr. Diva Boone. And Dr. Boone has dedicated her career to the understanding and treatment of parathyroid disease, combining compassion, knowledge, and experience to provide world-class care to all patients. After obtaining her doctor's degree, her MD at Cornell Medical College, Dr. Boone completed a general surgery residency at New York City, an endocrine surgery fellowship in Chicago. She then subspecialized in parathyroid surgery. She joined the Norman Parathyroid Center in 2014, where she performed over 3,600 parathyroid operations and consulted with thousands more patients with suspected calcium and parathyroid abnormalities. In 2020, she left to open the Southwest Parathyroid Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Very few surgeons worldwide have treated more parathyroid patients than Dr. Boone. She's a frequent speaker on parathyroid disease. She enjoys teaching both patients and other physicians about calcium, vitamin D, and the parathyroids. And in today's talk, we discuss what it is, and we really go into lab values because you really need to know your own lab values. Oftentimes, it will say it's normal when it's not. So we go into all of this as well as her take on vitamin D, which I know is a big topic these days. And this is just full of life-changing information. And Dr. Boone was one of the speakers on my summit. And there was 10 to 20 people, because they heard this talk, that they realized they had an issue and sought help with Dr. Boone. So this is not something we want to overlook. So stay tuned. Welcome, Dr. Boone. I am, I can't even tell you how elated I am to be with you. And this is the first time we've seen each other since the last interview we did together on the summit, which changed so, so many lives. So welcome. Yes, thank you. I am really excited to be talking with you also. Uh, it's really great, actually, to see you and what you do for people with bone health. And uh, I really admire what you do. So I'm, I'm glad to be here, excited to be here. Well, thank you so much. Before we get started, I just have to tell everybody who's listening how life-changing, like absolutely stay tuned for this entire podcast because this information, we were, ta we were talking before, before we just got started, how many lives have been changed. And I'll tell you the story in a minute about my husband's patient, but you had said like over like between 10 to 20 people contacted you after the summit. And I know you've mm -hmm. actually done surgery on people and changed their lives. So Oh, this is so amazing. But just a quick thing about my husband. So my husband's an OBGYN. He's an you know, obstetrician gynecologist. And for some people, especially a lot of younger patients, he's their only doctor. So someone had come in and just with symptoms of fatigue, which so many people are tired in today's modern age. It's, it's not that unusual. And so anyway, but he said he ordered the blood work. And it comes back and the calcium was level. We're going to go into this in the podcast, but the calcium level said 10.9. And that lab for, said 10.8 was their normal range. So normally, normally he would have thought, oh, it's just a little high, no big deal. Because that's what they're taught in med school. However, because of your talk on, on the summit, he knew that there are different values for that. So I reached out to you and you told us what additional tests to take. And anyway, the 38 year old patient has an enlarged, has a parathyroid tumor and is having surgery. And her whole life is gonna be totally different now. She could have had major osteoporosis if this wasn't picked up. So that's just one example of how critical the information we're going to talk about today today is. But I spoke to him this morning. I told him I was into, oh, please, thank you. Please tell her thank you for me. And But that's, Great. you know, all the people, so many people listening to Summit have, see, have, have really looked into this afterwards. So yeah. this is just so great. So I'm just more excited to even share it with more people. So let's just get started on the very basics. 
before we even go into, you know, the parathyroid, let's just talk about everybody has blood work and everybody gets their calcium value on their blood. So why don't you just start with that and what that means and how we interpret it and why maybe those numbers aren't so correct. Sure, sure. So yeah, so calcium is part of a of the basic metabolic panel. So people who get labs done yearly, they probably have had their calcium checked. And calcium, most people, when they think of calcium, they think of bones, but calcium is actually really important throughout your body for a lot of processes. And your brain actually depends heavily on calcium. Your nervous system depends healthily. So your muscles, your brain, all of these things rely on having a, uh, a set level of calcium. And so when you're checking the blood calcium, you're, you're checking kind of the, how well the body is regulating that. Now, because calcium is so important, your body keeps it at a very tight range. So most people, when they get their calcium back, uh, it's going to be in a fairly tight range for, for an adult, say for a woman over 40, uh, it's going to be somewhere in the mid to high nines in milligrams per deciliter. And you'll see that on the, on, you know, on your result. And it usually stays in that, in that range. And that's because your body is doing that on purpose because your brain needs that level of calcium to be in that range to function properly. So, um, so we get this level. Now the labs, as I've mentioned to you before, the labs often have a range that's a little bit too broad. They will give a range that's a little bit too far on the low end and a little bit too far on the high end. Um, and it probably should be a little bit tighter. And actually that has happened with labs over time. You'll see um, uh, labs vary a lot, but it's actually gotten tighter so that they they will show it as, as abnormal if the calcium is say 10.5, whereas 10 years ago, it might've said that was normal. Now it will mark that as high. Um, but so calcium is so important for these all these purposes throughout the body, not just your bones, actually the bones um, you know, are, are kind of the main storage place for calcium in your body, but really your, your brain and your nervous system need the, need that calcium. Uh, so that's why we're regulating it. And I don't know if you want me to get into the parathyroids, but the way that we keep yes, that yes, in have range. Yes. The bones, this is right. so important because yeah. people listening, you know, yeah. want to know, okay. So, so yeah. So uh, one thing you look at, so one is, so if, if there's a problem with calcium, especially if the calcium is too high, it's typically a problem with the parathyroid glands and patients will come to me and they'll say, well, I have osteoporosis and my calcium's high. That's a good thing because that seems logical. You know, if you, if you're, if your bones need calcium, that seems logical. If you have a high calcium, then that's good for them. That's actually not the case. It's actually bad for your bones to have a high blood calcium. And the reason is that if you do have a high blood calcium, that indicates that you very likely have a problem with your parathyroid glands. And the calcium, it may be high in your blood, but actually it's high because your parathyroid glands are taking calcium out of your bones, which is contributing to your osteoporosis, not helping it. So the parathyroid glands are this essential, you know, step here. Parathyroid glands are what regulate the calcium and they are the, the things that are trying to keep that calcium in that tight range that I mentioned. Parathyroid glands care a lot about keeping the blood calcium regulated. They don't care about the bones so much. They actually just use the bones really to, to regulate the calcium. So if the calcium drops too low, parathyroid glands will turn on. They'll say, okay, it's, it's like a thermostat in your house. If it gets too cold, the thermostat senses that, turns on, makes that parathyroid hormone to get that calcium up. The parathyroid hormone goes to the bones and takes the calcium out of the bones. They're your, they're your storage spot for calcium. So if there's a problem with your parathyroids, they often stop regulating things properly and they just make too much hormone. And that just keeps taking calcium out of your bones, even though you don't need it to be taken out anymore. So you can get severe osteoporosis as a result of this tiny little tumor. And these, these are not big tumors. These are, you know, it's the size of an almond. A uh, tiny little tumor can cause severe osteoporosis because it's making parathyroid hormones, making PTH, and that is taking calcium from your bones. And the interesting thing is, and this is what I've seen, a lot of times it's missed. And we're going to talk about the yes. numbers in a minute. And a lot of times it's missed. And the, on the good part though, is when someone discovers this, you know, it, it's one of those where we stay with osteoporosis. Yeah, we yeah. stay with osteoporosis. There are no quick fixes, but right. if this is one of the underlying root causes, 
it, it is a quick fix, actually. Right. right. And right. we'll talk about what, what the, so finish talking about the parathyroid and, and what happens with, you know, vitamin D as, as well. But in terms of, well, actually, no, before you do that, give us the exact numbers, because what, what, I, what you told me in the past, which was very, very upsetting, and I found it to be true talking to people, is that in medical, why don't you tell about medical school and how they teach the numbers, why not every doctor, if it's a little high, like my husband yeah. was like, oh, it was normally prior to your talk, if it was a little high, I probably wouldn't have been concerned about it. So why don't you yeah, go so into that a little bit? Unfortunately, this is still very common for, for doctors to, to downplay this. And for some labs, it's true. If it's just a little bit off, it's not an issue. Calcium is one where it really is an issue because your body, we know your body keeps it in a tight range. Um, whenever you have some electrolyte that is so critical for your nervous system and your, your blood, I mean, it's critical in, in many ways. Whenever you have that, the body's going to keep it in a tight range. So having something that is just a little bit off in calcium is significant. And um, unfortunately, you know, medical students do learn what the parathyroids are, but they don't learn a whole lot about them. So, uh, and the, the old thinking was, if it's just a little bit off, it's not cancer, so you can just let it go. And they would tell people to just let it go until certain things happened. Certain things being if you get a kidney stone because you're, there's a higher calcium in your blood and that's all going through your kidneys. And so you have a higher rate of kidney stones. Uh, or if you have fracture, so if you have get significant osteoporosis and you break a bone, then it's time to treat it. Um, and that's probably, I, I don't see that as the right approach because I don't want to wait for those problems to occur. Um, and the other thing is that often before those really significant events occur, people feel bad. And this is the, you know, beyond even the, the bone issues, people tend to have symptoms with parathyroid disease, including the biggest one is fatigue, brain fog. Um, you know, I remember I mentioned your brain depends on this. So that's often the, the symptoms that weakness, um, not being able to sleep through the night, just being exhausted all the time. So before you even get those, people tend to feel these symptoms. Unfortunately, parathyroid disease occurs most often in postmenopausal women. So as you can imagine, all of these symptoms get attributed to menopause and they're told they just have menopause and this is, this is what life is. You just deal with it. Um, and then they, they wait for kind of some of these complications to occur before they will refer for treatment. Um, so it's, and what we learned in medical school also was that, you know, it doesn't really cause symptoms unless the calcium gets really high. And that's not true. Actually, what is true is that even calcium that's just a little bit off can cause you to have osteoporosis, can cause you to have fatigue, uh, can cause all of these other complications. So it's, it's really um, something where we still are a little bit deficient in our medical school education about parathyroid disease. Um, it's still something where the it, people are being taught to kind of watch it until it gets really bad. Um, and it's one of the things I try to emphasize when I do CME lectures for doctors, I try to emphasize the fact that, you know, even before all of this stuff occurs and it will occur, we know over time you will get complications from it, but even before that people tend to feel awful. And that's a reason in itself to treat it is to just improve their quality of life. Um, so there's a real deficiency in our, in our education right now. And the medical establishment, as I'm sure, you know, changes very slowly. <laughs> so, so even though I can tell you, I can. You know, I can pass out talking about how this is important, but it takes a long time for doctors to realize that over time. And uh, sometimes with this disease, it takes a doctor getting it uh, because I have, I actually have a, a bunch of doctors that refer to me after they got parathyroid disease and they wanted it treated because they felt bad. And, um, and then they realized, okay, maybe my patients need to get this treated as well. So it often takes something like that, or even a, a patient who goes back and says, you know, Hey, I felt really tired and now I'm back to playing pickleball and doing my activities. And, uh, uh, once they, once they realize that, that, you know, that, that people do feel better and you can actually reverse osteoporosis and you can fix their kidney cell problem and you can, you can help their kidney function. Um, then they start to to realize how important it is to be treated. But okay, so been, let's go. Yeah, yeah. 
But it's been overlooked. (laughs) Yeah. And the other thing that you taught me is that, and really everyone who listened to your talk at the summit is that you have to also look at your blood work. You can't just say, oh, okay, it doesn't have a red flag. I'm good because what I learned from you is that it's not the same. The range, depending on your age, you'll have a different number. And the labs just have one basic range. So give us right. the numbers. So everybody get a yeah. piece of paper out and write this <laughs> yeah. down because this yes. is so important for when you get your blood work because your doctor, well-meaning, not to say these are bad doctors, they're not. Um, it's just they didn't learn it. And so right. you know, so tell us the numbers, the so, ages that yes. you yeah. So we'll get to the numbers. Yes. Yeah. So, so the numbers often... Um, as I mentioned, they go a little bit too low and a little bit too high. So a lab will often give a range like 8.5 to 10.5, which is a huge range for calcium. Most adults, one, they're going to be in the nines. So that's kind of a general, in the nines is a good number, but most people are going to be in the mid to high. So somewhere between 9.4 to 10.0 is kind of a great range for adults over the age of 40. If you're younger than that, you can have levels a little bit higher. So somebody who's in their 20s can have a 10.7, and that may be normal. It's going to drop with time, and it's not like a sudden drop off. You know, you turn 30 and it drops. It's it's gradual, but but over time you should see it kind of dipping down back into the nines as you as you get closer to 40. So if you're in your 30s and you've got calcium levels of 10.2, that could be normal. I'd want to get a couple more results and see the trend, but uh, but that may be normal. And then if you're, but if you're over the age of 40, 10.2 is not normal. And if you're over the age of 60 or 70, a 10.2 is definitely high. Um, You know, a 10.1 in a 40 year old is borderline. It's a little bit on the high end, not crazy, maybe an issue, but maybe normal for that patient. But a 10.1 in an 80 year old is likely parathyroid disease until proven otherwise. And that 80 year old's blood work on the basic lab test can say normal, correct? Yes, it often will say normal. Yes, yeah. because low labs differ a lot in their in their normal range, and um, it, you know, it's 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 been a it's been a struggle to kind of get them to uh, bring the level down. But I have seen where some labs, yeah, the, it'll say up to ten point eight is normal. Other labs will say to ten point one is normal. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the the twenty five year old may have a calcium of ten point two which is normal for them. And it's flagged as high, but I have, you know, I have my 80 year old with a 10.1, it's flagged as normal because that's not appropriate for them. So it's, it's difficult. Um, they don't correct for age. They correct for children. So they do, if you have a, if you, you know, they do have a pediatric range, but for adults, they just give one simple range, often 10 point something, 10.2 to 10.6 is the most common range um, for, you know, what they call normal, but really it's, you have to look at it. And if, if you're, especially if you're not feeling well, especially if you've got osteoporosis, especially if you've got these other issues, uh, a lot of times people discover this on their own because they feel bad and they're trying to figure it out. And they start looking through their labs and they see, oh, my calcium was 9.8. And that's why I think it's so important to follow your labs over time too, because you'll see a trend going up and you shouldn't see that as you get older. It should be trending down if anything, uh, but you'll see that trend. Oh, my calcium was 9.8. And then a couple of years ago, it was 10.1. Now it's 10.4. And it may stay in that, you know, that kind of low tens range. Um, it doesn't always rise with time. And that's, that's another uh, misconception among doctors is they think that as the d- disease gets more severe, the calcium will get higher. It's not always true. It might stay in that low tens range, but over time you start to get those symptoms, even if it doesn't get any, even if it looks kind of mild on your labs, it's not really a mild disease. Okay. So the person, and just actually before we get into yeah, what other tests we should do, what about low calcium? Do we ever see that? Yes. So low calcium is its own issue. Uh, low calcium is usually um, will cause, actually can cause a high PTH just like a high calcium, but it's due to a different, it's a different thing going on. So low calcium causes what we call secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, low calcium is not a problem with the parathyroid glands. The parathyroid glands have to respond to it. So remember the parathyroid glands, their whole job in life, and they're 
they're the simplest endocrine glands because they do just one thing. You know, it's very easy to understand. They just want, that's all they care about is calcium. You know, they are solely focused on that. So if the calcium is low for any reason, the parathyroid glands react to that and they make more hormone. And what they're trying to do is raise your calcium. And as I mentioned before, they don't care about the bones. They will take all the calcium out of your bones that they can so that they can get the blood calcium up. Um, low calcium is often caused by things that cause um, problems with absorption. So people who've had a gastric bypass, for example, they have a lot of trouble absorbing certain nutrients, calcium being a big one. And they lifelong need to be on supplementation because if they aren't, they will develop low calcium. Um, if somebody's had any sort of uh, or a large operation on their intestines, they are at higher risk. So anything that causes chronic diarrhea or malabsorption can cause this chronically low calcium. And that does lead to the parathyroid glands kind of getting activated and making more parathyroid hormone. But that is the parathyroid glands doing their job or doing the right thing for you, trying to get your calcium up. It may cause osteoporosis, uh, but the problem is not with the parathyroid glands entirely. It's with, it's with whatever is causing your low calcium. Okay. So when the person finds this out, the other tests, and actually really everybody with osteoporosis should be getting a parathyroid hormone test anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. So do you want to tell us about those levels when they get the yes. parathyroid hormone? Level? Yeah. So parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormone is really important. And that's, I mentioned, you know, the parathyroid glands do one thing and they do it with just one hormone. So it's really simple. They're, they're working with just one thing. They're working with a hammer, you know, and everything to them is a nail, but it, they, they do regulate your calcium very well because they are very good at making this hormone. But PTH is the hormone, parathyroid hormone. And um, we, if you're going to interpret calcium levels, it's helpful to have that parathyroid hormone. Now, I will say parathyroid hormone cannot be, uh, it cannot be uh, described in isolation. So I really move people away from saying normal parathyroid hormone versus abnormal parathyroid hormone. Because people will ask me, you know, is, is, my, is my PTH high? What does a high PTH mean? Because it means my parathyroids are making a lot of hormone. You can only interpret it with the calcium because you have to know if you're, if your heater's on, you have to know, you can't tell if that's appropriate or not if, unless you know what temperature it is in the house, right? Because it's inappropriate if your temperature is 90 degrees, but it's appropriate if it's 50 degrees, right? So I can't know just by knowing that the heater's on, I can't tell you whether that's good or not unless I know what temperature it is. It's the same with the parathyroid. So you tell me your PTH is high. I don't know. That, that could be normal or it could be abnormal. It depends on what your calcium level is. So, um, so PTH, so I do, I, I uh, discourage people from kind of looking at it in isolation because doctors tend to do that. They tend to just look, oh, this is high. You know, this is, a, this is abnormal. I need to fix this. But before you do that, you've got to look at the calcium. So if your calcium level is high or on the high end, your parathyroid hormone should be low, meaning your parathyroid glands should respond to that high calcium by turning off. So if you see a high calcium and you see a very low PTH level, that's an appropriate response by your parathyroid glands. And that means your high calcium is caused by something else. And there are other things that can cause high calcium. They're much less common, but they can occur. And if your parathyroid hormone is low, it's likely one of those things causing the high calcium. Um, can you just give an example, like for example? Yeah, so there, there are some the rare cancers that can cause high calcium um, because they produce a hormone that's like PTH. Um, and then there's, there's, there are also cancers that can cause significant bone disease uh, with release of calcium and you can get a high calcium. Um, a lot of people who come to me with high calcium are very nervous because if you search online, you're gonna see cancer as a cause and people really panic about that, understandably. Um, but the, 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 the important thing there is it's easy to tell whether that's whether you can rule out cancer or not by checking the PTH. Because if you have a high calcium due to cancer, PTH is going to be very low, really in the low range. If it's not, then it's not cancer. Um, so I can reassure people, your high calcium, it's very easy to tell the difference. High calcium is usually caused by primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, but if it's not, you know, cancer is one of those things you look for. Sarcoidosis is another one, which is you know, it's, 
it's a it's an uncommon autoimmune condition, but if you do have sarcoidosis, that can cause high calcium level. Um, there are a few things like that, but by far the most common thing in people who are out walking around are is, is parathyroid disease. Um, so if you get your PTH level, if you get your calcium level and it's high and you check your PTH and it's also high, well, that's fairly straightforward. You can tell from that, okay, it's high, my PTH is high and that's causing my calcium to be high. My parathyroid glands are overactive and as a result, I have a high calcium. Um, the lab results that confuse both patients and doctors are when the calcium is high, but the parathyroid hormone is in the quote, normal range. And this is why I hate talking about normal versus abnormal for PTH, because it really is not normal versus abnormal. It's appropriate versus inappropriate. Um, so is it appropriate for that calcium level? That's what you always have to ask is my PTH appropriate for calcium. So if my calcium is high, remember I said the appropriate thing is for your parathyroid glands to shut down, to not make much hormone. If they are making a quote, normal amount of PTH, that is a problem. That is, that is a situation where your house is 90 degrees and the heater is still on. It may not be on full blast, but it shouldn't be on at all because it's hot. And so that, that's the thing is that your parathyroid glands, if your PTH is normal, that means they're still making hormone in the presence of a high calcium. And that is diagnostic for primary hyperparathyroidism. So that is very confusing for patients as well. And for doctors, sometimes doctors will say, well, your calcium's high, but your PTH is normal. So I don't really know what's going on. Well, we do know what's going on. That's a parathyroid tumor. Um, but it's, 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 that's why it's so helpful to think of PTH as inappropriate for your calcium versus not appropriate for your calcium. And you can't look at it by itself. You know, I also like a tool that we're going to have in the show notes. Um, I, I printed it up oh, here, yes. but yes. this is really wonderful. So if people are listening and like, ah. Dr. Boone <laughs> and her right, nice right. Work. too many numbers. <laughs> yeah, has has an, 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 an and this is free, correct? This is not yes, something it's all, yeah, for. free. So you write your right age, now. your calcium level, and your PTH level, and then what happens when when they submit this? So, it, it will interpret it. Yeah. So I, so I created this basically so people can can type in their levels, type in your calcium, type in your PTH, and age is on there because age is important for calcium levels. So it, for me to determine whether it's normal or not. Um, and so I, I wrote this program to give you an assessment and, um, and it, I think it's, it's pretty good, <laughs> but you, you type in your calcium and, uh, I'll tell you whether that's normal for your age or not. And then type in your PTH and I'll tell you whether that is appropriate or not. And basically can, can often give you the diagnosis and say, this is consistent with primary hyperparathyroidism. Obviously it's online, so I can't diagnose you with anything, but I can say these labs at your age are consistent with primary hyperparathyroidism or they're consistent with secondary hyperparathyroidism or they're normal. Um, it'll go through, you know, it goes through all the different scenarios and you can plug in different values to see the different interpretations, but it will tell you whether this is likely primary hyperparathyroidism. And I know that patients do use this and, uh, and, and plug their numbers in because sometimes their doctors don't know how to interpret it. Uh, and that's, you know, that's because they didn't really learn they didn't learn it very much in med medical school. And, uh, and so patients will go in there to plug in their numbers and then they can, you know, once you get more information, then you can attempt to go back to your doctor or see a different doctor and, and say, you know, and now you have the confidence to say, look, I'm pretty sure I have this because uh, these numbers are consistent with it. And the parathyroid surgeon. <laughs> so it's right. not like, you know, you're right. nobody. The parathyroid right. surgeon, this is what they says. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. How, many, how, many, right. how many surgeries have you done? On <laughs> uh, it's, it's above 4,000 now uh, for <laughs> parathyroid operations. Yeah, because this is all I do. So I just, just do parathyroid surgery. And that's been true for the last about eight years. So yeah. So, that's so the interesting thing though, and I remember when we first talked, I was so surprised that you don't have to do all sorts of invasive testing, right? Once people right. have, you know, go into that right. a little bit. Right. So interesting. Yeah. So once you, once you know that you've got this, so if you, if you, or if you suspect if you, you have a high calcium and you have a normal or high PTH, then it's pretty clear that something is wrong with your parathyroids. Now there are rare exceptions. So obviously a doctor needs to review it, but uh, most likely you've got parathyroid disease. And once, once the doctor confirms that, uh, 
the treatment is surgery. This is, this is a problem of overactive glands, either sometimes one tumor, sometimes two. You've got four parathyroid glands. It's the only thing your body got four of, um, but you've got extras essentially. Um, sometimes it's a problem with just one, and that's the most common scenario. You've got a tumor on one parathyroid gland. It's benign. It's a benign tumor, um, but it's on just one. Sometimes it's a tumor on two. Sometimes all four glands are diseased, uh, but we know that your parathyroid glands are the problem if you've got a high calcium and a higher normal PTA. So we know there's something going on with your parathyroids and you don't need any imaging studies to, to find it, to prove it. That's different from most tumors. So most people, when they think of a tumor, they either think of a mass that they can feel or a mass that is seen on a CAT scan or something like that. They think of something, you know, a mass that you can see. And a lot of times you can't even see these. You can't feel, you definitely can't feel them because they're deep in the neck. And you, can't, you often can't see them on any, on any scan. So you may get your scans back and they'll just say negative. And, and people start to doubt themselves and think, well, do I really have it? I know you do. It's just that our, our scans are, her, um, they're, they're made for certain things. They're not great at finding parathyroid glands. And there's, there's a, a you know, a, multiple scans we can do. But if you've got a small parathyroid tumor, uh, which can still cause as much damage as a large parathyroid tumor, uh, it may not show up on any scan ever. And these tumors, interestingly, sometimes they stay very small. So you can have a little pea-sized tumor that's wrecking havoc on your body, uh, and it's tiny and doesn't show up on any scan. So what I do, you know, I do, um, I do a scan beforehand, but I, but I actually am not doing it to find the glands. You can the the main way that you find the glands is actually to go in the neck and look at them, um, and that's what I do for for every patient. Is I go in through it's through a tiny incision here at the base of the neck. Um, you go in and you just look at all four parathyroid glands, and they're mostly all right here around your thyroid. That's why they're called parathyroid. If anybody's wondering, they're totally unrelated to the thyroid, <laughs> but essentially they're a totally different organ. But they're called parathyroid because they were discovered next to the thyroid before we knew what they did. So we just named them parathyroid next to the thyroid. Um, but so they're, they're usually right here next to the thyroid. You can go in there and you can find the tumor or tumors and, and get it treated without ever seeing it on a scan. And let, well, let's talk about, well, first of all, after what's so interesting to me is I probably had, besides the summit, because I've gotten so many letters from people that thanked me for your talk because they didn't realize that this could be the cause of osteoporosis. You know, they, it was missed. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of people that this is missed as we talked about. Yes. But for the people, I've had several patients that it was picked up and some down the road, you know, they already lost a tremendous amount of bone, but it's amazing after the surgery that things really improve. You know, if this is the root cause, it's just, it's, right. it's actually, as we talked about, this actually is a quick fix. <laughs> right, pe right. People get better, which, which is right. just, just, it's just so important because if this is not picked up, you're just going to continue to lose bone and go down this hard right. cycle, even if your numbers are staying the same. So let's right. talk about the surgery then. Okay. Someone figures out they do have high calcium and you know, either higher or normal, not normal, um, whatever you call it. Right, right. The, the inappropriately <laughs> normal PTF. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they, they, they have the surgery then. Can you just walk us through what this kind of surgery entails? Yes. So it's a, it's very satisfying as a surgeon to do this operation because you get that kind of immediate response. That's just in the bones. I mean, the bones take a little bit to show any improvement on your DEXA scan, but right away your bones are healthier because they're not having that PTH taken out. And if you're, or that calcium taken out. And if you, people have bone pain a lot of times with this, where they actually will feel an ache in their bones and that improves immediately after surgery. So it is very satisfying. Um, but the, but the actual operation is a, it's a same day procedure. It's outpatient. You, you know, you go in, um, and, uh, it's, it's a about 30 minute procedure during that time, I will make an incision, which is about an inch long and look at the glands, take the, take out the bad ones, um, sew it up. And about an hour and a half later, you're able to leave the hospital. Um, and the, the, the big thing with this is that Afterwards, you know, your body has this adjustment period where the calcium goes from being high and drops down to being normal. And your body doesn't like big shifts. So, so I actually give people lots of calcium right afterwards, 
which is confusing because they say, well, my calcium's high. Why are you doing that? Well, right, it's going to drop pretty quickly. Your parathyroid hormone actually drops immediately. And then over a couple of days, your calcium drops. So everybody has to take calcium and vitamin D, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit. <laughs> vitamin D is important too. Uh, but you take that calcium and the symptoms of parathyroid disease tend to start resolving in the weeks after. So bone pain is the big one that just immediately gets better. But then over the next couple of weeks, people will start to feel like they have their energy back, like they're sleeping better through the night. They're do they're enjoying things again because this causes depression and anxiety and that starts to lift. Um, so all of these things start to improve, even you know beyond the bone disease. The bones are very important too, but just in how people feel and their overall emotional well being starts to improve right away. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's really great. So the interesting thing is because I was I got letters from people from the summit who were in other countries. I mean, there were people yeah. who flew in because mm -hmm. they. You know, they liked you. I guess the other thing is, are, is it important to go to a parathyroid surgeon versus do, would a head and neck surgeon do this? I mean, do other surgeons do it? And you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes a general dentist will do other procedures where sometimes right, it's best right. to go to the real specialist, right. but do other right. doctors do it or would they always send to a parathyroid surgeon? I don't actually know the answer to that. Right. <laughs> other surgeons do it. This is, but this is an operation where you should go to an expert. And the, the reason is that it's a very hard operation if you don't do it very often. So I make it sound easy. Like you go in 30 minutes, you know, look at all the parathyroid glands and you're out. But that's only because I've done this thousands of times. So if you haven't done it thousands of times, it can be very, very difficult to find the parathyroid glands um, safely and quickly. And so I have stories of people who, you know, they went to a general surgeon and they spent six hours in their neck looking around. And that's a long time to be in someone's neck. Um, there are lots of important structures in the neck that you don't want to hurt, like the nerves that control your voice. Um, and so it's not a good idea to, to be in there. And it's not a good idea to be under anesthesia for six hours either. But so if you go to somebody who is less experienced, it's a, it's a very different experience than coming to someone like me. There, there aren't a lot of people like me who just do parathyroid surgery. So I'm pretty, I'm very subspecialized. Um, but, and so, and as a result, my approach is a little bit different, but I have a much higher success rate and a very low complication rate. So uh, in terms of the success rate, my success rate is so high because I can look at all four glands. And I mentioned before that sometimes these scans don't show anything. Well, sometimes they will show something. They'll show a single adenoma. And this, the patient will go to a regular surgeon or even an endocrine surgeon, and they will, they will try to do a focused operation. So they'll go in there and they, they're just focused on what shows on the scan. And they'll take that out. Um, the, the problem is that you can have a second tumor. Now they'll try to check the PTH in the OR to make sure that it drops, but that's really inaccurate. It's a very unreliable test. So it can drop if you have a parathyroid tumor, even if there's a second tumor, your PTH will drop right away. Uh, and then in some people, it takes a while to drop. It doesn't, it, it can take hours to kind of drop down. It doesn't, it doesn't do what the textbook says, which is textbook says it should drop, you know, by half every four minutes. Well, not everybody reads the textbooks and so not everybody's bodies read the textbooks. So they don't do that. Um, and it can inter, you know, then the surgeon can kind of dig around for hours looking and, uh, and, and not be very productive. So the, the more common thing is to do a focus operation, go in, take out one tumor and be done with it. And a lot of people will be cured with that. Probably about 70% will be cured with that. Um, but that means a 30% failure rate. That means 30% are going to have something else going on, a second tumor or possibly hyperplasia where all four glands are involved. And in that case, they're going to end up needing a second operation. So about 10% of the operations that I do are re-operations, people who have had failed operations somewhere else. Um, so, and I, and I get those cases because I'm the expert, so they, they will fly in. Um, but most people want to get this done in a single operation rather than having to go through this twice. So it, it's, it's better to have an expert, somebody who does this a lot uh, and can kind of can find the parathyroid glands and evaluate them during that one operation so that you have the best chance of a cure. 
No, I never understood that. Um, my son, when he was, I guess, three, and he's 34 now, but he had something called a clastiotoma in his ear, a rare, a rare thing. Yeah. And the regular ENT told me, okay, I'll be, you know, like four days in the hospital and this and that. And I said, well, how many have you done? And he said, like 10. I thought to myself, 10. I said, and I was just surprised that he would even want to do this. You know, are there people that do this all the time? Sure. So we went to, you know, New York City to a specialist and okay. he was in and out. He didn't have, it wasn't four days. Right. And, but I just, I always thought to myself, like, why wouldn't you, if you know someone else is really skilled and is going to be, right? you know, so, so yes, I think right. that's good advice. If indeed you find out you have this, make sure you go to a parathyroid surgeon. Right. So that you get because, the best care. Yeah. Yeah. And your surgeon, I mean, your ENT may have been very good. It's just that they, he didn't do it very often, you know? So some right. say, well, I have this general surgeon that's really, really good. Well, they, they may be really good at colon surgery, but to do parathyroid surgery, you can't really be that good at it unless you do it a lot. Uh, and I, and you know, what we call an expert is actually just 50 a year, which means doing it once a week, which even I would say that's not enough. <laughs> it's that's not enough to see the variation um, and to and to really get a good sense of the parathyroids because the parathyroids they're interesting and they they are kind of weird they have the highest variability um, of of any thing in the body so in location they can be anywhere from up under your jaw down to your chest so and then they could be kind of in your neck here so they they have a lot of variability uh, they have a lot of variability in how normal glands look so uh, if you're dealing with a small tumor, you really want a surgeon who has looked at a ton of parathyroid glands and can tell that's normal or that's not normal. Um, and I, I see this a lot with less experienced surgeons. They don't really know what parathyroid glands look like or the range of normal for parathyroid glands. And they get confused and they start removing normal parathyroid glands and that can lead to problems itself. And so you, you get into all these problems based on inexperience not because they're bad surgeons. They may be really good, maybe excellent surgeons. Just if you don't do this all the time, it's hard. And so for anything like that, where it's, it's a, you know, it's a challenging operation that not everybody's doing all the time, then yes, trying to find somebody who does do it all the time is a really good idea. Just like you did with your son. I mean, you should do that with parathyroid disease too. Yeah. yeah it just, it shocked me. And I knew the person. I thought to myself, are, are you, and when I asked right, him, right. how many have you done? You know? <laughs> right. It was good that he was honest with you to, I mean, and said only to men. Um, and I said, well, do you know anyone that does this all the time? <laughs> yeah. And then he gave yeah. me names, but I, I right. don't know if I had right. asked, he was going to set him up in the hospital for four days, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. And Anyways. patients are told that too. They're told, you know, this is going to be several hours in the, in the operating room. So if, it, if the surgeon says that, you know, you're going to spend several hours in the operating room, you're going to be in the hospital overnight. You know, it's a, it's a bigger, it's a much bigger deal uh, because they don't do it as much. So it's, they, you know, they, it's, it's a much bigger process than when you come to me. Yeah. And anybody, what I saw interesting is that you have, there's, I guess, cause you're in Scottsdale. So you're in beautiful Arizona. Right. Yeah. <laughs> nice place to come. Yeah. Stay in a resort afterwards. Yeah. yeah. About, about over, over half my patients are coming from outside the state. So, uh, so yeah. Oh, yeah and it's great that you take, in. you take the insurances too, which mm -hmm. is so, so yeah. important. Okay. So let's go to another topic that is very near and dear to this community. And there's controversy in the yeah. New York times. I mean, it's such a hot yep. topic now, but you come from it from a different perspective than a lot of other people. And we're talking about vitamin D. So mm -hmm. give us your perspective and what you see okay. with vitamin D. Because I said, yeah, you, yeah. See a, you see a very different segment. I see a different segment. Yeah. Right. Yes. So yes why don't I you do. Yes. Spare your so feelings. So vitamin D, I love this topic. I love the topic of vitamin D. And it, and it is so, uh, it's so, it's such a popular topic. I mean, people really care about vitamin D. Um, and it is essential. I think there's there's a couple things that I always tell people right off the bat, which is first, vitamin D is a hormone. And it is very important to remember that it's a hormone. It looks like a hormone. It actually looks, if you look at the structure of vitamin D, it looks just like the other, some other hormones in your body. And you've got to treat it like that. It's, it's um, a lot of people treat it like a dietary supplement. Like, oh, I can just kind of take it and it's no big deal. But you wouldn't say that about a hormone. You know, you wouldn't say, well, I'm just going to take some estrogen and just pile it on because, you know, if a little bit's good, I'm going to take some more. You wouldn't do that. And it's the same with vitamin D. So it's a hormone. So first, remember that. Um, second is it's not even really a vitamin. It's actually 
and actually doesn't meet the criteria because your body, a vitamin is something that your body doesn't produce and your body does actually make vitamin D in the skin. Uh, so, it, or and activated uh, vitamin D. So it's not really a vitamin and it is a hormone, but I'll call it vitamin D anyway, <laughs> rather than hormone D, which might actually be a better name for it. So vitamin D is absolutely essential and it's very important with parathyroid disease and with the parathyroid glands. So the parathyroid hormone, remember I mentioned that it goes to bones and it takes calcium out of the bones. Well, that's not all it does. There's a couple of other things it does as well. And one of the main ones is to activate vitamin D or help activate vitamin D. So if you have more parathyroid hormone, it's going to go and activate that vitamin D. And what does active vitamin D do? Well, one of the main roles for activated vitamin D is to help your intestines absorb calcium. So that's another way that your parathyroid glands try to get the calcium up is they're telling that vitamin D, okay, go on, get to the intestines and help us absorb more of the calcium from the diet. So those are, those are the main ways that the parathyroid glands are helping to raise your calcium. So vitamin D is an essential step in there. Now, vitamin D is also a cause of confusion in parathyroid disease because, uh, because of a certain a kind of a, uh, something that is, seems a little bit off. So when we measure vitamin D, um, there are different forms of vitamin D in the body, but we only really measure one most of the time. So if you go to your doctor and you say, I want to check my vitamin D, it's going to be a 25 hydroxy level. That's the inactive form. So your doctor checks that. And that's generally a very good assessment of your overall vitamin D status for, for you and me who don't have parathyroid disease, that would be a really good marker of how well our bodies are doing at getting count of getting vitamin D and storing it. The problem here is that parathyroid member, it stimulates that conversion. So it's, it's causing all that inactive vitamin D to get converted to the active form. So your inactive form drops. you you have low inactive vitamin D when you have parathyroid disease, but you have a high active vitamin D because that's partly what's bringing up your calcium. So for patients with parathyroid disease, they're very frequently diagnosed with vitamin D deficiency. And unfortunately, the doctors uh, often have a knee-jerk reaction to this, which is prescribed vitamin D. So they see the low vitamin D and they don't look at the calcium, or if they do the calcium, they say, well, it's just a little bit high, you know, calcium's 10.3, eh, uh, vitamin D is 20, yeah, uh, that's low, let's give vitamin D. The problem with that Wait, excuse is that me, if they haven't checked yeah. the parathyroid yet, they just no, order that. No, okay. they usually tell, right? They, they don't, okay. they're not even, it's not even on the radar. Okay, they just got get it. low vitamin D and they see a high calcium. And they, they often have forgotten that relationship. So it, there's a lot of stuff you learn in medical school. <laughs> and I've, I've forgotten a lot of those chemical reactions. I, I understand. But so they've forgotten this whole relationship between calcium, vitamin D, and PTH. Um, and they just see the low vitamin D. They don't have a lot of time to think about it. They just prescribe vitamin D. The problem with that is that taking more vitamin D is just going to raise your calcium further. So when I see patients who are taking vitamin D and they have high calcium, I say, the first thing to do is stop taking vitamin D because that's pushing your calcium up further. Um, and then afterwards, after the operation, once that PTH level goes back to an appropriate level, then your vitamin D level will generally rise and you're, you're, you will no longer be vitamin D deficient. So that vitamin D deficiency is often kind of an incorrect diagnosis for these patients because if they actually check the active form, it would be high. But the inactive form, which is the one we check, is low. And the reason we check that, so a lot of patients will say, why don't we just check the active form in everyone? Well, for people who don't have parathyroid disease, it's not as good of a, of a long-term marker because it breaks down much faster. So it's much better to check the inactive form because that's a better uh, gauge of how you're doing over time. Uh, it's just, it's only inaccurate in certain populations people with parathyroid disease being the main one. It's not accurate in that population. But what about um, people, what's your thought on people who are listening with osteoporosis? They should right. get the parathyroid, but they should really get both vitamin D then, right? Because that's, that could be- It's issue. helpful to check yeah. that. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, but if you, if you do have the high calcium, I mean, step one should be check a calcium and a PTH together. You know, it's right. like- I'm thinking everybody should get, yeah, everybody- <laughs> Everybody I, every, I think everybody yeah. with osteoporosis, a diagnosis yeah. of osteoporosis yeah. should get the parathyroid and then yeah. you can get both active because they don't, we don't want to miss anything. It's so important. Right, right, right. And so I mean, if we, would you agree with that? Then they could get both forms of the I active? Think, I, 
I think usually you don't even need it because, oh, okay. you know, usually it's pretty obvious. If I see somebody with a high calcium and a low vitamin D, that's usually parathyroid disease. I just need to check the PTH and I confirm it. Got it. Um, so, they don't really so it. Got it. you know, yeah. So it's not even, it's usually pretty obvious. Um, I do have some patients where, you know, the, the picture is not as clear and that's when I'll get sort of different forms of, of vitamin D. So just to see what's going on, but most of the time it's, it's usually pretty obvious and, um, and yeah. And how low do you see the vitamin D when it's a parathyroid issue? Oh, it can go quite low. It can go, it can go under 10. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, it can go very low. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I still don't tell people not to take vitamin D before the operation. After the operation, I start everybody on vitamin D. Uh, because I want it, I want that vitamin D to help your intestines absorb the calcium. So right after the operation, everybody's on calcium and vitamin D. Okay. Um, the, the other problem I see with vitamin D and the bigger issue is for people who don't have parathyroid disease and then they have osteoporosis, what to do about calcium and vitamin D. There's been a, even, a, even taking calcium has been controversial, but vitamin D has some advocates online advocating these massive doses of vitamin D. So, you know, you can go in the, to the store and you can buy vitamin D. If you go to the vitamins aisle, you can buy vitamin D in 400 micrograms or in 10,000. I saw one pill, one, one bottle had 10,000 units of, of vitamin D per pill. Uh, one had 400 units of vitamin D. And what do you take? Um, some, some people online really advocate very high doses of vitamin D and that may be tolerable for some people, just like some people need different doses of medications. The problem that I see with vitamin D is people taking massive doses and actually causing their calcium to go high by because of the vitamin D. So I actually get a lot of people coming to me who have been on 5,000 units a day or 10,000 units a day for years. And those patients they sometimes do fine in, initially. Their their body's able to tolerate it, but vitamin D, remember, is that is a is a fat soluble vitamin, and so as you take more, it just gets stored, it gets stored throughout your body, and over time, if you're taking these massive doses, it can really build up, and so they may not even be in the toxic range. They may have a vitamin D of eighty, and if you're looking at your labs, usually the the range is thirty to a hundred. Well and over a hundred is toxic. Well, you see the toxicity well before that in some people. So they may have a vitamin D of 80 and their calcium now is 10.3. And that's because of the vitamin D. So they come to me because they're worried about parathyroid disease. What I have to do is tell them basically stop taking the vitamin D, let your vitamin D drop. And that may take six months for it to drop from 80 to under 50, uh, which is where I like to see it. it. May take a while, but once you do that, most people at that point, your calcium will go back to normal and you actually feel better as well. People can get the symptoms of, of parathyroid disease when their calcium is like that. So that's why I'm so passionate about vitamin D is I would, I would like people to stop taking these, these massive doses because it's very unusual for anyone to need them long-term. Um, more moderate doses, I like. So 1,000 units a day, 2,000 units a day, that seems to be safe. Uh, I haven't seen anybody get high calcium as a result of that dose. So I, I advocate kind of 1,000 or 2,000 units a day, but not more than that. And um, in terms of the I, number you advocate, you know, on the 25 so, hydroxy. Yeah. So I, I liked, I like it to be in the kind of 30 to 50 range. Uh, some people like it to be much higher, but there's not a lot of evidence that getting much higher really does any good. We do know that if you've got a chronically low vitamin D, that you do have complications with your bones. Um, that's, that's well known, but that's with levels that are incredibly low, like under 12, you know, when you have these really, really low vitamin D levels. Um, so we know, we know that that's a problem. And we know that getting your vitamin D up above 20 seems to uh, mitigate these complications. What we don't know is, you know, getting your vitamin D above 70, is that going to cause any extra benefit? Um, some people can tolerate it. There are people who take high doses and they have a vitamin D of 70 and their calcium is normal and they're fine. Um, I would just be cautious because we don't have a lot of evidence that, that getting it there really causes more of a benefit than getting it between 30 and 50. And I don't ever see over 
under 50 causing high calcium, whereas I do see it causing high calcium once you get above 50. Now, I will, I will admit freely that I see a set of population. I see a, a you know, I see, I see a minor set of people who are taking this and there are people out there who take high doses of vitamin D and they're fine and that's great. Um, but I would recommend that you follow your calcium. If you're taking these high doses, make sure you're checking your calcium and it's not going into the high range. You don't want your calcium going above, you know, what is, what is considered normal for your age. So if you're 50, you don't want to see it above 10.0. Um, you want to make sure that it's staying in the normal range. So I would say some people, they do need to take a lot of vitamin D, uh, but just, just monitor it, monitor your calcium level if you're doing that. And you have some good articles on your website where you've done, you've done a tremendous amount of research on this and you come from it from a different perspective, seeing some of the negatives when people are taking right. too high, where right. a lot of other people don't come from your perspective. That's why I think it's. Right. They, they, cause they don't, they don't get that set of people who have high calcium and for them, it seems like, you know, oh, well, you know, maybe that's, it's rare. I mean, it's, it's happens frequently enough for me to get you know, at least one or two a week coming to me with, with very high, you know, high calcium. They're consulting me for high calcium because they're concerned about parathyroid disease. And then I have to look at it and say, well, I think this is actually due to vitamin D, not parathyroid disease. It's hard to tell if your vitamin D is also really high. Sometimes you can have a parathyroid disease that's in there, but it's kind of hidden. And so I can't tell until we stop the vitamin D. So yeah, my perspective is a little bit different. I do think vitamin D is essential. I take vitamin D myself. So, um, Someone online actually accused me of, you know, being very anti-vitamin D and, and I, and I said, well, I'm not anti, I'm, I'm actually pro-vitamin D, but you know, in a responsible amount, you know, it's, it's, it's a hormone, right? So treat it, treat it with the respect that you treat other hormones, right? We have a lot of respect for hormones. We know we don't just take massive doses of testosterone, right? Everybody knows that taking a massive dose of testosterone wouldn't be good for you. But uh, for some reason with vitamin D, because it's called a vitamin, we treat it differently. Like, well, if a little bit's good, then I'll just take a lot. Uh, I just want people to take it in moderation and to understand the effects that it can have, to understand that these high doses do have effects, that it's not completely benign. It can, it can cause your calcium to go high and you should just watch out for that. Uh, but I, but I take vitamin D myself. <laughs> so yeah, me too as well. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I take it. But <laughs> oh my gosh, in moderation. Talk. Yeah. <laughs> it's really important because I, you know, you're dealing with this every day and you, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just thought it was important to share your perspective. Well, Oh gosh, and I'm excited that you're going to come again to the summit that's happening oh, yeah. in March, and yeah. so we can change more lives. But I, yeah. it made me so happy. I when I when I've got a few emails, and one in particular, how she was flying in for surgery and thanked me so much. But it was really yeah. you who who made such a difference oh. because you know people don't know this. That's why it's so important. For everybody listening, write those numbers down. Right. You know, make sure to check your values because if this is an issue, it's something you absolutely need to deal with. Yeah. And I'll have your, you want to give your website? That's the best place. Is that right? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. If you go to the website, that little app is on there. We yeah, just give it to everybody too. So they can hear it. I'll have it. In yeah. Notes, but. So it's, it's www.southwestparathyroid.com. So S O U T H W E S T P A R A T H Y R O I D. I spell everything right. But yeah, southwestparathyroid.com. Um, and it's got that little diagnosis app on there and you can read about the center. And, um, and if you, if you, if you're unsure about your labs also, um, I, I will evaluate anybody's labs who sends them to me. So there's a, there's a free evaluation form where you can actually just put in your numbers and I will send you an email telling you what I think of them. Um, and I can, I can tell you, yeah, this is consistent with parathyroid disease or not. So especially if the app is not giving you, you know, the answer that you, you're, you're not sure about, or, you know, you just, you just want more. I'm happy to review anybody's labs for free and, uh, and just email you, uh, send you an email evaluation. Wow. That's, that's really so kind of you. And yeah. then I know, I mean, what I, what I've learned from meeting you is that you care so much about this and you, I do you yeah. really, cause it's so sad, right? It's so yeah. sad. Yes. And you know, something can be corrected and you know, mm -hmm. Unlike right. other parts of osteoporosis or other issues as well, you know, if someone's miserable from fatigue right. and right. it's due to this and it's been missed, which it often is. And yeah. why is this person not living their best life? So, yeah. So it's just, you know, I just can't thank you enough. And I've been 
I, I was just so happy that um because someone it was it was Irma Jennings who introduced who said oh, right. I think Dr. Diva Boo would be a great guest for the summit. And I, I said, Oh, absolutely. But yeah. because of that now, I don't know, what did we say? 20, 30 people, right? Lives have been changed. So yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So it's just very generous of you to be sharing this information and I'm just so yeah. glad we met and could be passing this on to, oh, to make yeah. more of an impact. So is there any last minute things you want to share? No, no, I just want to say thank you. I, I love what you do as well. I mean, I see, I see all the things that you do for people <laughs> and uh, it's great. Thank you for having me on. I'm always happy to talk and uh, I look forward to the next summit and, and being on that. Oh, well, thanks so much for joining me and for all the work you're doing. Look forward to staying in touch. Yep. Thank you. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Boone as much as I did, and now have a better understanding of the importance of the parathyroid gland and how we need to look at our blood calcium values. And if they're a little high, that is not okay. And as she said, in the nines is good, but if it's starting to go into the tens and you're over 40, you need to, you need to really look at that and have that evaluated. And all of us should be getting, if any issues with our bone health, parathyroid hormone values. So we can really make sure this is not something we're missing. And the good news is that so much that can be done. I mean, the treatment is surgery, but it's effective, it's doable, and it's amazing the results. And Dr. Boone is so accessible. She has a great, you know, on her website, you can put your values in and she will give you an assessment of it. And she really wants to help. So definitely I'll have the links in the show notes to her website where she has all this valuable information. So thank you so much for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.